Darren, um, who is a, is, a, is a poet and an author and a designer, apart from being uh, an academic and a, and a media researcher, um, has been doing a lot of work, um, not just specifically in, in, in unearthing, let's say, some of the, the underbelly of, of, of McLuhan, but also connecting it um, to a whole range of, of other uh, practices. Um, he had been um, talking earlier today about how the relationship of McLuhan uh, works to, to Harold Innes and, and Ezra Pound, and I think he'll be uh, perhaps talking about that in his, in his lecture today. Um, and I hope to have uh, Darren back um, in the project next year in, in 2011 uh, when we have the McLuhan uh, centenary in, uh, in Berlin. So I hope to see uh, you people as well, uh, hopefully at one of the events in Berlin or at a number of the other events that hopefully will be happening um, all across Europe. So um, Darren, um, please take the stage. Um, the floor is yours for the inaugural, inaugural uh, McLuhan in Europe uh, lecture. And we'll take some questions and discussion then after. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I'd just like to start by thanking everybody at, at uh, Future Everything and Transmediala for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure. OK. Artists, writes Ezra Pound, are the antenna of the race. In the introduction to the second edition of Understanding Media, so does Marshall McLuhan, who updates and expands the metaphor. Art as radar acts as an early warning system, as it were, enabling us to discover social and psychic targets in lots of time to prepare to cope with them. This concept of the arts as prophetic contrasts with the popular idea of them as mere self-expression. If art is an early warning system, to use the phrase from World War II, when radar was new, art has the utmost relevance not only to media study, but to the development of media controls. When radar was new, it was found necessary to eliminate the balloon system for city protection that had preceded radar. The balloons got in the way of the electric feedback of the new radar information. As Friedrich Kittler, one of McLuhan's most successful contemporary intellectual heirs, puts it, information technology is always already strategy for war. War elicits new forms of communication, retrofits old ones for its own purposes, and violently blasts existing media landscapes into drastic new forms, producing unexpected juxtapositions. World War II was the force that put Marshall McLuhan in contact with two of the leaders of the early 20th century European avant-garde, Pound and Wyndham Lewis. McLuhan met Lewis when teaching in St. Louis in 1943 and maintained a close working friendship with him over the next two years when both were living in Windsor, Ontario, of all places. McLuhan and Hugh Kenner traveled to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. in 1948 to meet Pound, where he was incarcerated for putting his poet as antenna aphorism into practice, producing radio broadcasts in support of Mussolini's fascist government during World War II. McLuhan had read Pound with enthusiasm while a student, long before the war, and corresponded with him for several years after. By the time McLuhan joined the faculty at St. Michael's College at University of Toronto in 1946, he was, in all likelihood, the only expert on modernist poetry at the time in all of Ontario. Canada's kind of odd in that it only gets an experimental modernism about mid-century and there really isn't much of it there in the first place. McLuhan biography Philip Marchand noted that in later years, McLuhan always credited the poets of the modernist avant-garde as the real inspiration for his media studies. So then, Marshall McLuhan was one of the founders of an entirely new discipline, communication studies, but he was also a professor of English literature, deeply invested in the values of poetry as a tool for thinking about media and culture. Contemporary journalism and popular culture, when it thinks about McLuhan at all, tends to see him from the wrong end of the telescope, positioning him as a technologist. In the masthead of its first issue in March 1993, Wired magazine declared McLuhan its patron saint. And for many commentators, this marked McLuhan's return to a position of public legitimacy after the indifference that his works faced for much of the 70s and 80s. <laughs> 
the first actual article on McLuhan in Wired, which was in uh, January of 1996, Gary Wolf's The Wisdom of St. Marshall, The Holy Fool, describes him as a scholar, teacher, political and economic analyst, but there's no mention of poets or poetry anywhere. It's an odd blind spot because McLuhan's writing is obsessed with, saturated with, avant-garde poetry and poetics, both as form and subject matter. Take the only known letter from McLuhan to Harold Innes as an example. Though he is arguably even more important to the formation and theory of communication studies than McLuhan, who describes his Gutenberg galaxy as a footnote to Innes's work, Innes was rarely read outside of Canadian communication circles until the resurgence of interest in McLuhan's work in the 90s. This letter is important because it's not only one of the first clear statements of McLuhan's interest in the importance of what he calls technological form over informative purpose or content, but also of his notion of organizing an entire school of studies around the subject of communication. So what does he write about when attempting to attract the attention of Innes, a political economist and historian by training? Avant-garde poetry and poetics. What McLuhan sees in avant-garde technique is a vehicle for discussion, discussing the function and effect of communication on society, which he thought was the only thing that would keep English departments from going the way of the study of Latin and Greek. He seizes on Stéphane Mallarmé's discontinuous juxtaposition of unrelated items as the signature method of the first avant-garde, symbolism. Now, rightly or wrongly, and mostly wrongly throughout his career, McLuhan would use the word symbolism as a shorthand for anything collaged because of its ostensible etymology as symbaline or thrown together. In terms of its usefulness for cultural analysis, McLuhan reads symbolist technique as a diagram, as a way, as a diagram of the way that the stories on the front page of a newspaper butt up against each other. This is my favorite picture of McLuhan. There's a, he's cut out of the, uh, the funny pages, which he's reading on the obverse of the newspaper, and you can sort of see him uh, perusing it from the other side. So here is the artist at work as cultural antenna, pointing directly to a formal quality of media that was previously so close to us, so familiar, that it was entirely invisible. This is a phenomenon that Innes refers to in his own work as bias. In his introduction to the first edition of Innes's The Bias of Communication in 1951, McLuhan writes of using avant-garde poetics to organize the data of the historian and the social scientist. This is a direct argument for the value of reading the records and statistics of technology through cultural forms. McLuhan's writing style is infamously as poetic as his reading strategies. This is especially true in his work with graphic designers, like Counterblast with Harley Parker, which draws both its name and its style from Wyndham Lewis's Blast. But it also applies to his conventional typeset prose. In responding to one critic, McLuhan wrote, my canvases are surrealist, and to call them theories is to miss my satirical intent altogether. As you will find in my literary essays, I can write the ordinary kind of prose anytime I choose to do so. McLuhan's mosaic prose, based on the juxtaposition of multiple fragments to create startling and memorable effects, culminates in the creation of his own literary form, the probe. And this is one of David Carson's treatments of McLuhan's probes in the uh, eponymous uh, book of probes. The probe is a sort of weapons-grade aphorism that uses punning, metonymy, and other literary tropes to staple two or more disparate ideas together. Probes alter perception by associating ideas rather than serving as building blocks in a logical argument. Their purpose is to raise questions more than provide answers. Probes are heuristics, machines made of words whose job is to help us figure out how we know what we know. Now, all of this is a sort of preamble to the two questions that I want to ask today. First, why have we forgotten about the importance of poetics, both for how we read McLuhan and for how we think about communications in contemporary media? And two, which follows from question one, is something still blocking art's early warning system from functioning to its full potential? Part of the problem is the contemporary attitude about poetry other than music lyrics, or what I like to call the penicillin, penicillin theory of poetry, 
Writing poetry is now a minoritarian art form, roughly equivalent in scale, economics, and impact to making doilies for the church rummage sale. And I say this candidly as a poet, a publisher, and a scholar of poetry. To save ourselves from admitting the truth of this situation, we use poetry as a kind of cultural inoculation, putting it in the ad space on buses and subway trains and congratulating ourselves about how enlightened we are. All that reading poetry on the subway does, though, is absolve you from having to actually buy and read a book of poetry or, God forbid, go to a poetry reading. This situation has been a little more than a century in the making and has everything to do with media theory. To cite Friedrich Kittler again, whose thinking on the subject is heavily indebted to both McLuhan and Innes, before the second half of the 19th century, literature, especially romantic poetry, had a monopoly on the delivery of vivid cultural experiences. That changed in the mid 19th century when virtually every form of electromechanical media reached a mass audience within a few decades. For Kittler, from the era of silent cinema onward, film establishes immediate connections between technology and the body, which make imaginary connections unnecessary. Film exhibits its figures in such detail that the realistic is raised into the realm of the fantastic, which sucks up every theme of imaginative literature. And this is from Murnau's Faust. People continue to write lyric poetry, of course, in the same way that people used to keep cheering long after Elvis left the building, or citing him after he died. But with poetry's powers diminished, from Kittler's perspective, the new sciences and technologies made it necessary for poets to renounce the imagination. After the turn of the century, all poetry could do that was new was to comment, comment on its own material qualities, which, beginning with Mallarmé and Christian Morgenstern, was the source of the very avant-garde that so fascinated McLuhan. And this is an early Morgenstern piece called Fish's Night Song, uh, which fe features no letters at all. It's basically a poem about its own materiality. So the reason, then, that the early avant-garde technique is a useful tool for thinking about technological form is that it is technological form and that it talks about that form continuously. Another related problem is our tendency to divide how we think about the world into what the sciences are allowed to say with credibility and what poetry in its diminished capacity and the other arts are allowed to say with credibility. Bruno Latour has written about this problem extensively, most directly in We Have Never Been Modern. His major point is that such great divides between the territories of disciplines mean that all sorts of hybrid objects fall through the cracks, and, that the pro and, that the, and these processes that create these hybrid objects remain invisible, unthinkable, unrepresentable. In contemporary society, society, such hybrid objects are precisely the ones that are the most interesting and the most controversial. As McLuhan observed, the problem with a cheap, specialized education is you never stop paying for it. In an era of skills-based practical education, we desperately need interdisciplinary thinkers, people to think about what's not being taken into account. What I'm talking about today does have real implications, and if we ignore them, we get the culture we deserve. Just ask the philosophers at Middlesex. So what would it mean to take McLuhan's poetics seriously and to take contemporary experimental poetry seriously? What I want to argue, shamelessly and polemically, is that poetry has left the building. It's time to take another look at the poetic qualities of the excluded languages of the everyday, the languages of science, the languages of the internet, the languages of graffiti. Not poetry in a generic poetry on the tube and greeting card sort of way, but writing with a very specific quality. Annoying, provocative writing that many people might not consider to be poetry at all, but what Latour would call hybrid. Writing that is too odd or too difficult to classify using any other category than poetry, especially when it bridges divides like the one between literature and science. One relationship that really has changed since McLuhan's death is the one between biology and technology. During McLuhan's lifetime, technology was hard external, massive, and fixed. 
Contemporary technology is increasingly minuscule, soft, internal, and wet. Biology does figure into McLuhan's thinking about technology, but usually as something that was in the process of being externalized. He frequently wrote about electrical technology as an extended living model of the human nervous system. However, McLuhan was also acutely aware that any such binary relationship could and would suddenly reverse itself. This principle appears in several, several places in McLuhan's writing, including one of the laws of media, where something reverses into its opposite, and as the indeterminate figure-ground relationship that became one of his favorite probes after understanding media. As such, we need to read McLuhan through his own method and think not about technology expanding and extending the human sensorium, but the way that it also insinuates itself into the biological. McLuhan does at least allude to this reversal directly in several places. One is a probe in Culture is Our Business called Going, Going, Gong, where he writes, since Sputnik, there is no nature. <clears throat> nature is an item contained in a man-made environment of satellites and information. Goals now have to be replaced by the sensory reprogramming of total environments and DNA particles alike. Another is in his 1964 essay, Notes on Burroughs, published in the same year as Understanding Media, where he writes that the complement to the gulping or swallowing of nature by the machine is Burroughs' use of heroin to turn the human body into a medium, an environment that includes the universe. Picking up in part from where McLuhan left off in his writing on biomedia, Eugene Thacker argues that the body was always a medium already and that the biological and digital domains inhere in each other. So our task is to think about the varying, competing, and oscillating ways that biological bodies overlap with a number of interdisciplinary fields that classify, visualize, diagnose, simulate, invade, and describe them, a complex and shifting series of overlapping figures and grounds. This is exactly the sort of terrain where a probe becomes useful, where truth is multiple, ambiguous, controversial. I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the time that I have today talking about one project by one poet, Christian Book's Xenotext Experiment, because I think it raises exactly the kinds of questions that we need to think about in terms of media today. Some very basic questions about what communication is itself. So who is Christian Book? Christian Book is a best-selling Canadian poet, which immediately signals that something odd is at work. In the interest of full disclosure, it's also worth mentioning that he's been my best friend, drinking buddy, and a frequent collaborator for over 20 years. I edited his second book, Unoya, which was published by Coach House in 2001. Unoya is a very peculiar book, really the only book of its kind that could be written in the English language. Inspired by Georges Perec's novel La Disparation, which was translated into English by Gilbert Adair as A Void, it makes no use of the letter E. So Eunoia consists of five chapters, each of which tells a story using only words that contain the same vowel. For example, chapter E of Eunoia contains only words where the sole vowel is E. Book dreamed up Unoya during one of a series of nine-hour road trips that we made between Toronto and Boston in 1995. At the time, I remember him calculating that it'd take about seven months to write. I told him it'd take seven years to write and that it'd make him famous 50 years after his death. The tedium is the message, I said, a joke which now appears as the epigraph to the afterword. I was half right. It took him seven years, but it made him famous immediately, winning the prestigious Griffin Prize in 2002. In 2008, an upgraded edition of Unoya was published in the UK by Canongate Books. Here too, it was a massive success, reaching number eight on the Amazon UK chart during Christmas week, rubbing shoulders with books by Nigella Lawson and Barack Obama. The Times eventually listed it as one of its top 10 books of the year. For book, there were several points to the Unoya project to excise all romantic metaphors of inspiration from his poetry, and to demonstrate that it was possible to produce something that is both beautiful and entertaining while working under rigorous constraint. It also positions his writing as a kind of cultural laboratory and his poems as individual experiments. Remarkable as it is though, I'm not gonna talk about Unoya today. What I wanna talk about is what he's planning for a follow-up. <clears throat> 
Christian Book's Xenotext experiment is a project designed to assess the aesthetic potentials of genetics in contemporary culture. It takes its name from the Greek xenos, or stranger. As a prefix, it usually designates a difference between species. In the Xenotext experiment, Book takes William S. Burroughs' oft-repeated aphorism that language is a virus from outer space, literally. His Xenotext is an alien text. The Xenotext experiment itself is both simple and audacious. Book plans to embed a poem into the DNA of another life form in such a way that it will actually write further poems as it grows. There are actually a number of precedents for the Xenotext experiment in science, art, and literature. This might seem surprising until you stop to consider that novelty isn't a major criterion for book's aesthetics or for conceptual writing in general. As the example of Unoya demonstrates nicely, his standard operating procedure is to find a really good idea that has never been developed to its full potential, then execute it in a more thorough and sophisticated manner than anyone else has. So I'm gonna briefly catalog some of these precedents before moving on to describe the experiment itself. On Star Trek The Next Generation, season six, episode 20 in 1993, The Chase, the Federation, the Klingons, the Romulans, and the Cardassians are all racing to decipher a message that's been encoded in the DNA of all humanoid species in the Alpha Quadrant. And that's the DNA code supposedly behind Geordi in the background there. The Chase was inspired by another science fiction text, Carl Sagan's 1985 novel, Contact, where humans discover a message from a much older alien race embedded deep within the value of pi. Sagan, of course, was a scientist as well as an author of fiction. The ideas in contact also appear in Sagan and I.S. Shlovsky's 1966 book, Intelligent Life in the Universe. Scientists other than Sagan and Shlovsky have also given this idea serious consideration for decades. Hiromitsu Yoku and Tyro Oshima's 1979 paper is bacteriophage phi X174 DNA, a message from an extraterrestrial intelligence, argues that biological media should not be neglected as possible information exchange systems between interstellar civilizations, and that there are even some likely places to begin looking. Bacteriophage phi X174 was the first DNA-based genome ever sequenced. It appears in the extremely common and hardy E. coli, which over the years has become one of the biopoet's cellular media of choice. From the perspective of Yoku and Oshima in 1979, artificially modifying bacterial DNA in such a way that it could simultaneously reproduce and carry an intelligent message encoded in its base sequence was still many years away. By that point, though, they were quite confident that launching an encoded microorganism to other stars was well within their reach. But why would they bother? Biological media, they argued, has certain advantages over electromagnetic waves. Unlike telecommunications media, biological messages embedded in hardy microorganisms that automatically reproduce themselves could quickly cover an entire planet and persist for very long periods after the delivery. Other standard problems encountered in telecommunications, such as frequency, bandwidth, and the direction and directivity of antennas, and even theoretical competition with the noise of an alien society's own electromagnetic communications, do not arise with biological media. Yoku and Oshima believed that if the carrier microorganism was carefully matched to its environment, it would be possible to eliminate errors introduced into the message during replication. Though the rest of Yoku and Oshima's theories have proved sufficient, surprisingly prescient, I think this dream of noise-free communication is something of a fantasy, and I'll explain why later. Barely a decade after Yoku and Oshima theorized that it would be possible to embed messages in DNA, artists, writers, and scientists were actually doing it. In 1990, Joe Davis began embedding tiny works of art into the DNA of E. coli. This is his Micro Venus, a minimalist piece of visual poetry that evokes both the Germanic rune for life and a line drawing of the female genitalia. He calls such creations infogenes and has designed them to be translated by the machinery of human beings into meaning and not by the machinery of cells into protein. His plan is very much in line with Yoku and Oshima's work, 
He wants to replicate infogenes by the trillions and then shoot them into space. In 1998, proclaiming that biological processes are now writerly, Brazilian poet and visual artist Eduardo Koch unveiled his Genesis project, one of a series of proposed ventures into a field he calls biopoetry. Koch's Genesis translates a Bible verse, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth into Morse code, the first language of global technological communication, then embeds it into the DNA of E. coli. Koch then edits the text by exposing the gene to radiation and documenting the random mutations. The results of Genesis have been presented as a gallery installation featuring projections of live cultures, still images, and artifacts such as a pastiche of the Rosetta Stone with the verse expressed in English, Morse code, and DNA codons both before and after the mutation. In 2003, Pak Chung Wong encoded the lyrics to It's a Small World After All into a strand of DNA inside Deinococcus radiogerans, an organism discovered in the 1950s when scientists were irradiating canned food in order to see if they could prolong its shelf life in the event of a nuclear war. The food still rotted, but the scientists became interested in deradiogerans because it survived. It can actually repair its own DNA quickly enough that it can withstand dosages of gamma rays a thousand times higher than humans. Some biologists, in a scientific paper from 2006 called Was the Earth Ever Infected by Martian Biota? Clues from Radio-Resistant Bacteria, have even suggested that an ancestor of this organism might have evolved in outer space, possibly on Mars. Language is a virus from outer space. Why are Wong and his colleagues interested in this process? They want to find a means of preserving cultural heritage for some unimaginable posterity. Organisms on Earth for hundreds of millions of years represent excellent candidates for protecting critical information for future generations. Book's Xenotext project differs from all of its precedents in several important respects. All of the aforementioned projects are interested in using biological media as storage containers for pre-existing texts. Most of the predecessors of the Xenotext project also imagine the possibility of the faithful transmission of information. Book, however, sees his work as a starting point, not a goal. In the Xenotext project, the host organism will respond to the sequence that has been grafted into its genes by mutating them into benign proteins that are themselves new texts. In other words, the microorganism that Book has implanted will become his co-author. So how does all of this work? Wikipedia usefully tells us that the main role of DNA molecules is the long-term storage of information. So what Book is doing is using DNA to store his own information as well as the genetic code. So how does that work? Remember Gattaca? Well, probably not. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's the point. The title of the film is a word that's made up of four letters, A, C, G, and T, which stand for adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, the four nucleotides that are the major components of DNA and RNA. Nucleotides appear in sets of three called codons. Book begins by selecting 26 codons and assigning one codon to a letter of the alphabet. But that's not all. DNA is also a set of blueprints for how to build a particular kind of body. DNA doesn't just replicate itself. Through a process called transcription, the codons in DNA are translated into instructions for the creation of proteins called amino acids. In RNA transcription, each of the nucleotides is translated into another. Adenine translates to thymine and guanine to cytosine. In this process, a nucleotide called uracil stands in for thymine. Transcription is a lot like a newspaper cryptogram, except that instead of one set of letters being gibberish and the other being meaningful, both sets are meaningful. Because of this symmetry, Book wants his string of codons to be capable of translating his embedded poems into other poems. What this means for Book's purposes is that every codon has to represent not one, but two letters of the alphabet, and that he is therefore always writing two poems at the same time, poems that are mutual ciphers of each other, 
There are 7,905,853,580,625 ways to pair up all of the letters in the alphabet. All Book has to do is find one of them that works in such a manner that when he writes a poem using one of the letters in the pair, it produces an equally interesting poem using the other letter. No poet in history has ever done this. It will no doubt come as a relief to many of you that he isn't doing this manually. He wrote a little program that allows him to input a cipher, then searches through the whole English lexicon for all of the word pairs that appear in that cipher. Book being book, though, these aren't the only constraints he's writing under. First, the poem has to actually be about the relationship between language and genetics. Moreover, the artificial gene he fashions can't impair the functioning of the microbe in any way or mutate it. So like Wong, Book plans to use D. radio gerans as his single-celled co-author because of its extreme hardiness. In order to make all of this work, Book speculates that he may have to begin by looking at existing harmless proteins for something that is almost meaningful and working backwards in order to reverse engineer his poem. Here again, the micro microorganism is emerging as a kind of collaborator in the process of authorship. Now, he's provided me with some examples of how all of this might work. He numbers his experiments and identifies them by codon pairs that define the cipher. This is one that he calls INGARY786. So in this cipher, the letter I corresponds to A, the letter N to R, and the letter G to Y. 786 is the total number of words in this cipher's lexicon. So underneath the alphabet cipher, you can see the way that the creation of words works. A base, for example, is also iciest. Binary is also caring, and bin is also car. Here's another one that Book calls WORVIT190. In this cipher, the Imagist poem, Tidal Words of Life, Copy Song, corresponds to Roads Vital in Song, Pick Life. These are, he emphasizes, starting points. But after hundreds of experiments over several years, he has yet to find a cipher that produces more than 786 words. That was the first one that I showed you. And most of these words are less than five letters long. As a result, he expects that the final poem will have to be less than 20 words long. His initial estimate was over 200. OK. So what would McLuhan's media poetics allow us to glean from the Xenotext project and its cousins? The medium is the message. McLuhan's most famous insight is that understanding communication requires us to pay attention to the materiality of media as well as, and often instead of, its content. Materiality is not just hardware and packaging, as Will Straw notes, but also the materially embedded character of cultural expression, its inscription, as with writing, or iteration, as with performances, within arrangements of technologies, bodies, and physical structures. Media forms provide the contours in which cultural expression is contained and shaped. Media forms store or transmit this expression in culturally pertinent ways. But as McLuhan and Wilfred Watson put it in From Cliché to Archetypes, new media environments, say the alphabet itself in the case of Eunoia, or the DNA inside of D radio gerunds in the case of the Xenotext experiment, are invisible and invincible until new artistic styles and probes bring them to the public's attention. We need to make them visible, and art is a very good way of doing that. It's not the historical context which enables the understanding of a given work of art, but the work of art which provides a context which allows us to understand a given historical situation. The Xenotext experiment is a kind of wake-up call to the surprising and sometimes controversial possibilities of biotechnology. It's also about the way that cultural expression, poetry in this case, is shaped by the forms that it takes and the ways that it's transfigured when it stops being words on a page. A poem inside a strand of DNA is not the same as letters written on a page or displayed on a screen. But DNA within a poem, DNA with a poem embedded in it is also quite remarkable. What should interest us is not the content of any of the projects I've mentioned, which ranges from perhaps banal or kitsch to not yet written, 
but the shift in perspective that simultaneously forces a reconsideration of what we mean when we talk about biology, media, poetry, the history of communication, and culture itself. Thinking about cells, molecules, proteins, and genes as surfaces for reading and writing, as media, in other words, has all kinds of interesting implications. One of them is the ongoing need to rethink what it means to be an author. McLuhan was fond of citing Wyndham Lewis's epithet for writers, the apes of God, as a way of pointing out the dual nature of writing, as a divine act of creation, and as a base imitation of another's creative process. The Xenotext experiment embodies both aspects. Moreover, this is not a poetry for romantics or auteurs. You can't do biopoetry alone. The Xenotext experiment already involves a variety of collaborators. Its technological expertise comes from systems biologist Stuart Kaufman, a MacArthur Fellow and the author of many books, including Reinventing the Sacred, A New View of Science, Reason, and Religion. Kaufman's work involves developing mathematical models to explain possible sources of evolutionary processes during the origin of life. He has offered to model the molecule that results from Book's effort, and they have funding for this, and the project will happen at some point in the next four years or so. Some of the aesthetic expertise for the project comes from visual artist Evelyn Colian, who has produced a portfolio of silkscreen prints based on work in the Xenotext project to date, and a sculpture based on the protein of D radiogerins. And as I've mentioned, crucially, the microorganism itself is a kind of collaborator, potentially writing new poems itself through the process of RNA transcription. And what are the readers? Who is this message for? Will they ever find it? Does it matter? At the heart of the Xenotext experiment are a set of basic problems about the nature of communication itself. In Speaking into the Air, John Durham Peters describes the history of thinking about communication as a spectrum that ranges, on the one hand, from the longing for perfect understanding to the risk of the total loss of meaning. The idea of using bacteria to communicate with alien intelligence merely underlines problems that are always present in any communicative act, the risk of reaching out and the real possibility of failure. What if a vastly more intelligent species, either in outer space or in some unimaginable moment in our own future, say when humanity is replaced by a race of intelligent raccoons, discovers our message to them and successfully translates it? O.B. Hardison describes the likely outcome with this analogy in Disappearing Through the Skylight. We can communicate with monkeys, but mostly we don't bother very often anymore because what we've discovered is that monkeys mostly want to talk about kittens and getting their tummy rubbed and where their next banana is coming from. Imagine being the monkey in that scenario. That's where humanity stands in the conversation with aliens. And that's the best case scenario. If Charles Fort and Stephen Hawking are correct, our attempts to communicate with aliens are most likely to result in wholesale destruction or slow digestion in some unimaginable extraterrestrial gullet. The Xenotext project also raises some intriguing questions about how we should read the natural world. What's at stake is the fine balance between perception and paranoia. Again, there's a long history of writers wondering about what new forms of technological media might allow us to decode and what it would mean if we actually found a message. In a 1919 essay called Primal Sound, the poet Rainier Maria Rilke asked, what if one changed the needle of a phonograph and directed on its return journey, on its return journey along a tracing which was not derived from the graphic translation of sound, but existed of itself naturally? Well, to put it plainly, along the coronal suture of a skull, for example. So he was interested in taking a phonograph, phonograph record and trying to play the cracks in a skull and thinking about the sublime possibility of what would happen if you actually found a message. So what if? New strategies for reading emerge all the time, many of which have little or nothing to do with the writer's intent, because language is inherently generative and excessive, and routinely frustrates any attempt to fix meaning. In the Philip K. Dick short story, The Preserving Machine, a character named Doc Labyrinth is looking for a way to safeguard works of classical music against various kinds of possible catastrophes. 
He builds a machine that turns musical scores into animals and sets them loose in the wild, only to discover later that they have mutated and that when he attempts to decode the original pieces of music, they too have transformed in unexpected and discordant ways. What I'd like to suggest in closing is that such transfigurations aren't to be feared as losses of meaning because they're inherent to the very process of communication itself. Every time we say hello, we risk being misunderstood. The point is, though, that we still take the risk. Moreover, it's in the little pockets of lost meaning and untapped potential that actually allow for the possibility of something new to emerge. Slavoj Žižek argues that innovation is actually the result of a particular kind of repetition. The new emerges at moments when something overcomes its historical context and reappears, not as it actually was, but as it might have been. If you want to build the future, you have to ransack the past for the pockets of what didn't happen, but could have and still might. If you want to build the future, you have to steal from the doubts, fantasies, fictions, wishes, and failures of the past. Walter Benjamin wrote about the angel of history facing the past, ceaselessly blown into the future. Harold Innes wrote about Minerva's owl flying only at night. Marshall McLuhan wrote about seeing the world through a rearview mirror. In each case, the message is the same. If you want to know about the blind spots in our own historical moment, let alone the future, you can only discern the edges of those blind spots by holding them up against history. But if you're paying attention to the forms of these ideas, in every case, we're dealing with metaphor, and that means poetry. Poets are the antenna of the race. If you want to know what Marshall McLuhan's writing has to offer for the future, it's time to turn in and tune in to the poetry of the overlooked, half-remembered, and forgotten languages that inscribe our bodies, our cities, and our technologies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Darren. Are there any questions, comments, feedback from the audience for, for Darren and his uh, look at McLuhan? Can you just come up to uh, the mic? I don't know, is there one on that side as well? No, just over here, yeah. It's a long walk. First of all, thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by the invisible. <laughs> fascinated by the invisible. To me, the invisible, i.e. space, like this, is psychoactive. And for me, poetry is pneumatic, sonic, enervating, uplifting, and it's essentially a matter of pneuma, breath, soul. And in terms of what I've heard, not only at this conference, but particularly in the newspapers, there seems to be a, um, an attitude of dystopia, which perhaps is a result of the progress that's been made. And um, I don't know where I'm going to go with this. I'm probably not going to come to any conclusion in terms of what I'm saying. But actually, I don't agree with you about poetry being marginalized. I can understand it because in, in, as some speakers said, in, in the brand consciousness, it doesn't actually appear. But nonetheless, it's immensely powerful as a form of art, which is an intangible form of art unless it's expressed in script. And it has an immediacy about it. That's all. OK. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in voice as well. So you know, I could. I could talk about that a little bit, I suppose. Um, one of the, I mean, I, what, what I'm, as a former publisher of poetry and an editor of poetry, I have a reasonably good idea how many books of poetry are sold in a given year. And it's, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the books that are actually printed. Um, in terms of spoken poetry, uh, yeah, perhaps there's a larger audience for it. But again, most of that is in the realm of popular music. Um, there are spoken word artists, there are vocal artists, 
that do uh, the kinds of extensions of, uh, say, you know, modernist avant-garde performances, and actually Book is one of them. One of the, the projects that he's done over the last decade is uh, an entire performance of Kurt Schwitter's Ursonata, which is the longest sound poem I, I think that's ever been written in any language. Um, so it enters, it enters into the discussion, but I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think we have a basic disagreement about uh, the cultural position of poetry at the moment. Um, I'm not arguing that that can't or won't change, and these are always, you know, dialectical processes where, you know, something is there in, in the background for a while and it eventually reemerges. Um, my argument is also fairly specific to North America and to English-speaking cultures. You know, I can't really talk to the role of poetry, uh, you know, in in other scenarios. But in in my experience, it's it's this discourse that's sort of been pushed into the background. Um, and as a result, what I'm interested in is where the poetic has gone and and the way that the poetic manifests itself in other aspects of culture. Because when we talk about science or when we talk about graffiti or when we talk about you know, the language of the internet, uh, we, we treat it basically as a carrier of information. We don't look at the language itself and you know, think about the, the poetry of, of something like the idea of a top quark or you know, the, the, the beauty of the language in a, um, in a walkthrough for a video game, you know, the, the kinds of you know, bizarre rhetorical uh, flares that you'll find in all of these documents that are pe people are just throwing up onto the web. Uh, and I think it's time to start looking at those kinds of things, to start thinking about how poetry works outside of the context of you know, poetry qua poetry. Um, so it's, it's, it, I hope it didn't come across as a kind of dismissal, but the, the idea is, is to sort of expand what we're thinking about when we think about poetry and what we think about what poetics can do for us. Yeah. It, it wasn't dismissive at all. Okay, well, that's good. That's, that's why I like Latour's work so much, is because he points directly to the things that get excluded from official discourses and you know, how we divide up the world and how we talk about the world. Thanks. Thanks. Um, in, this, in this context, have you also been dealing with code as poetry? Yeah, I mean, I, the, and there are uh, you know, uh, people from the open source community that you know, wear t-shirts that say code poet on them. Um, and Book is interesting in part because he can program. You know, this is one of the things that, that Friedrich Kittler says is you're not uh, you know, a fully fluent human, human being anymore unless you can speak at least one computer, computer language and at least one human language. Um, so I, I, I think that uh, you know, thinking again about the, the poeticity of, of, of code and of programming is an important part of all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people that have delved into that a lot more seriously than I have, though. So it's, it's, I'm aware of it, but it's kind of in the background for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else out there with question, feedback, commentary? Yep, please come down. Hi. Thank you very much for this for that wonderful talk. Okay, I want to I want to sort of address um, a little bit more about what we're seeing in the rearview mirror and and how fast we're traveling while we're watching this through the rearview mirror. And I kind of want to turn also the conversation back to McLuhan and what the McLuhan phenomenon and, mm -hmm. and how you might contextualize the McLuhan phenomenon, where basically McLuhan became a sort of his own medium for his mm -hmm. message, and how you would think about the role of poetry in a, an, a, an incredibly image and brand conscious um, environment, and in, indeed whether you think that the I idea of the experiment of propagating an organism is, you know, how that might comment on the um, re relentless self -pr promotion and self reproduction yeah. experience. Yeah, well, that's question. that's one of the reasons that I like that the the McLuhan Tupac image is because um, I mean we live in a world in which basically every conceivable surface is now inscribed, including the body, and predominantly those inscribed surfaces are brands of some form or another. So we need to think about the relationship between poetry and the language of commercialism, between the language of the corporate and the language of the corporeal, and you know, the, the kind of slippery position that the individual involves in the middle of that. And you know, Tupac is kind of infamously a, a far more productive rapper after his death 
than before. Like there was dozens of albums have been released of material that was recorded but never released during his lifetime. Um, and McLuhan is sort of similar in that way. I, so you can sort of think about the way that the way that the image of McLuhan is deployed, and that that came from this crazy website that I found with uh, uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of visual Photoshop mashups of you know McLuhan on on Kraftwerk album covers and. McLuhan with you know words you know running out of his mouth and sort of weird animated gifs and all kinds of crazy things like that. Um, so there, there there is a way in which the the what McLuhan signifies is a long way away from from you know what he actually wrote about and, and that's one of the reasons that I spent so much time today trying to sort of tie this back to what McLuhan actually said and what McLuhan actually did. Um, that being said, I think. There are there are a couple of projects you know that probably should happen around McLuhan's work, and one of them is is this this process of going back and kind of tracking you know what what McLuhan was interested in and what he wrote about versus how McLuhan gets used. And the other thing is taking the kinds of things that he was interested in and examining the period after his death from 1980 to the present, where there's this kind of massive gap in talking about exactly those issues. You know, people who study McLuhan only talk about the poets that McLuhan talked about, and so they replicate the same errors that McLuhan made when they talk about those poets. But there's like a 40-year gap where contemporary experimental and innovative writing uh, has a lot to say about media and culture and communication, and nobody talks about that. And there is this kind of weird division between English departments and communications departments where they each have a piece of the puzzle. It's like the Star Trek episode, you know, and they, if they're gonna make sense of it, they really have to be talking to each other and they don't talk to each other. So uh, th that's a kind of ongoing concern of mine and, and it's, it's really at the heart of, of what I'm interested in. So I, that's probably as close as I can come to answering that. Is, is that partly because uh, certain uh, pockets of, of academia also try to keep McLuhan to themselves? Because there, there's, there's so much of this uh, protectionism also around. Yeah, yeah, but there are also large parts of the, ac the academy that don't want anything to do with McLuhan. Like he had, I think he supervised over his career a total of about, of about eight graduate students because the U of T wouldn't let graduate students anywhere near him. And the U of T still doesn't have the uh, University of Toronto uh, you know, was home for both McLuhan and Innes over the bulk of their careers, and they still don't have a communication studies department. So there, there is this kind of like weird embarrassment about McLuhan. It's like, yes, we want to claim him, but no, we don't really want to have to own what that means. Uh, so so there's, there's a real ambivalence still around McLuhan and what his work represents. And, and I mean, it's, it, it's in the, the Transmediala project is really interesting. Uh, in terms of thinking about this because McLuhan in the 80s had an enormous influence on communication theory in Germany especially. And that work is being translated into English now. It sort of started appearing in the mid-1990s and really brought materiality back into the heart of what people talk about when they talk about communication. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino watching, you know, Hong Kong action films and then making movies which are then duplicated in Hong Kong and, and you know, the cycle kind of continues. Um, but uh, I certainly, you know, outside, even in communication studies, there are a lot of people that don't want to have anything to do with McLuhan. So he's interesting, again, because he's this kind of, this kind of hybrid, right? This, yeah, this controversial absolutely. figure. Yeah. Well, then, in that case, again, Darren, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for wrapping up the Future Everything conference. And, of course, also for opening up uh, a new look at McLuhan. Thank you very much also to Michel Kasperzak, who, uh, besides having invited you here to uh, Manchester, was also uh, curator and host yesterday's uh, GlowNet um, conference. Also, thank you to uh, Drew Hammond, the director of uh, Future Everything. And um, yeah, for tonight, of course, there's great music program. Um, going on or music programs happening. There's also the boat going down the river or the canal. Um, there's the award ceremony for the Future Everything Award at six o'clock in the Manchester Town Hall. So if anybody knows where that is, I'd be happy to go with you. Um, and uh, tomorrow is, um, I guess, playtime here in the Contact Theatre. 
play everything. Yeah, so it's not just games and play, but it's serious hacktivism um, for the young and old alike. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for participating in the conference. Have a great night tonight, and enjoy the rest of your festival. So, cheers. Thanks. <laughs>